and welcome history buffs. Today we'll be looking at a very special film that's near and dear to my heart. One of my favourite African adventure films is the kid Zulu. Based on the Battle of Rourke's Drift, this is the story of how just 150 British soldiers were besieged by 4,000 Zulu warriors deep in the heartland of South Africa. It's a prime example of classic cinema with epic battle scenes, breathtaking landscapes and star performances. But the greatest achievement of Zulu, in my opinion, was getting the audience to admire the courage of both the Brits and the Zulus. With no cheap tricks to demonize either side, in fact, as a kid, I was torn between who I wanted to root for. So aside from the obvious nostalgic affection you'll be hearing in this review, this was one of the first films that triggered my fascination with history. So it only seems right to look at both the film and the actual history behind the film. This is Zulu. So the film is set in 1879 South Africa during the colonization by the British. This was at an integral point in time where the British were coming closer and closer to conflict with the Zulus. An uneasy truce existed between the two empires and there was relative peace. The British were able to continue their expansion in South Africa and the Zulu kingdom was allowed to continue its way of life. However, this truce was tested when diamonds were discovered in Kimberley. Although only 800 miles away from Zululand, the British began to reconsider their position in South Africa and its natural resources. Pressed by white settlers and the untapped wealth of Zululand, war was inevitable. Amidst the increasing border clashes between the white settlers and the proud Zulu warriors, an ultimatum of 13 terms was delivered to the Zulu king Kechwayo. In it, a deadline of 20 days was given where the Zulus were demanded to disband their army and absolve their regiment system, the very way of life the Zulus depended on. Now, the closest way I can describe the Zulus is, if you can imagine the ancient Spartans of Greece, it was a culture based on warfare. The regiment system was a conscription of all young boys around the age of 14 to constantly train for the army and swear loyalty to their king. More than a forced conscription, it was a system of government that held the Zulu nation together. When the 20 days had run out and the Zulus refused to comply, the British had the excuse they needed to invade. At the head of 12,000 men was Lord Chelmsford. He and his men were confident of an easy victory over a technologically inferior enemy. The only problem Chelmsford saw in this campaign was actually getting the Zulus to fight. He had it in his mind that the Zulus would engage his forces with guerrilla tactics and avoid open battle. So splitting his forces, he led the bulk of his army into Zululand, leaving the remaining 1,500 troops to make camp at Isandlwana. At 8am that following morning, British scouts were patrolling a valley nearby. Unintentionally, they had discovered the entire Zulu army, a force of 20,000 warriors poised to attack the small encampment. Unprepared and overconfident, the British didn't have a chance, and despite all of their superior firepower, they were completely and utterly annihilated. This was to be marked down in history as the worst defeat ever suffered by a modern army against a technologically inferior indigenous force. What I especially love about this film is how it approaches portraying the Zulus. Despite them being the antagonists, the movie isn't negative towards them. Instead, it actually makes a really strong effort to show the Zulus in a positive way, but without being condescending. Every time a character in the movie says something that dismisses the Zulus as savages or makes a racist remark of any kind, there is always a character nearby to put them in their place. What do you know about Zulus? Bunch of savages, isn't it? <laughs> All right. How far can you run next march in a day? Oh, 15, 20 miles, is it? Well, a Zulu regiment can run. Run 50 miles and fight a battle at the end of it. Now, you have to consider the time when this movie was being made. The Civil Rights Act hadn't been passed yet, and apartheid was at its worst in South Africa. With the political climate, it would have been easy to make a film where the Zulus are portrayed to be barbaric savages attacking defenseless white people. Instead, we get a much deeper film than that, one that isn't biased and doesn't play favourites. The British are simply trying to survive, and the Zulus are fighting for their homes. There is no evil arch-villain on either side, and that allows the audience to sympathise with both the Zulus and the British, resulting in a much stronger film. Now moving along to the plot of the film, we finally get to meet our two main characters. 
One is Lieutenant John Chard, played by Stanley Baker, and the other is Lieutenant Bromhead, played by Michael Caine. Just like the Zulus, the Brits aren't portrayed to be any more or less evil. From their introduction, it's all about their personalities, their motivations, and how they deal with the situation they have been put in. And facing annihilation, their motivations are simplicity at its best. You will all be killed like those this morning. And now the sick in their beds, all of you. I don't think so, Mr. Whit. The army doesn't like more than one disaster in a day. Looks bad in the newspapers and upset civilians at their breakfast. Aside from the approaching battle, Bromhead and Chard have two very confrontational personalities. Bromhead was an aristocrat who came from a prestigious military background, where many of his male family members were high-ranked officers, whilst Chard was a more down-to-earth officer who preferred working alongside his men and most likely rose to the ranks. They both have a set ideal of how an officer should behave that conflicts with each other. I'll tell my man to clean your kit. Don't bother. No bother. Not offering to clean it myself. Still, a chap ought to look smart in front of the men. Don't you think? But what I find interesting about Bromhead is that he seems to play up to the role of being a pompous officer, almost to hide his own insecurities of being able to live up to his family name. You know my father was at Waterloo. He was. He got his colonelcy after that. Did he? And my great-grandfather, he was the Johnny who knelt beside Wolfe at Quebec. Did they make him a colonel too? No, you, you don't see what I'm driving at. You're telling me that you hold a professional and I'm the amateur. No. What I mean is, I mean, I wish right now I were a damned ranker, like Hook or Hitch. You're not, are you? You're an officer and a gentleman. He doesn't seem to really believe in himself once there is an impending threat, but out of all the characters in the film, it is his that is able to grow the most. The facade of social status and the romantic notion of war is thrown right out the window as they realize that it's only by working together can they survive. So when we see them bonding and settle their differences, we get a real sense of how their perception of war has changed. So now onto my favorite part of the film, the actual battle itself. And after a lot of build up, the film has already established how formidable the Zulu warriors are. There's a real sense of foreboding as the British simply wait for the Zulus to come, and even more so when they can literally hear the Zulus marching towards them. Damn funny. Like a... Like a train. In the distance. Despite every instinct telling them that they should run, they know that their best chance of surviving is to make a stand at a fortified position rather than being vulnerable out in the open country. So they wait, and wait for a battle they cannot escape, and when the Zulus finally arrive, you can see how almost hopeless the situation is for the British just by their sheer numbers. To intimidate their enemy even more, the Zulus play psychological warfare by chanting and smashing their shields together. Now it's interesting to see the differences in their battle techniques compared to the British. Obviously the Brits have an advantage with the use of projectile weapons, I grant you that, but we already know that the Zulus have defeated a much larger force, and they were armed with artillery, cavalry and rockets. They did this with an old Zulu battle strategy called the Horns of the Buffalo, which was introduced by Shaka Zulu right at the birth of the Zulu Kingdom. The way it worked was that they sent their strongest warriors in the centre representing the head and loins of the buffalo whilst the warriors on the left and right flanks were the horns. When the centre engaged, the enemy was focused on defence, unaware of the horns encircling them. It was this way of fighting that allowed the Zulus to conquer an entire empire. However, this doesn't mean that the British don't have a fighting chance as well. I mean, I know that they have guns, but you have to consider the fact that there's only 150 of them, and their rifles can only fire once before having to be reloaded. 
so they used their fighting technique that has also secured them an empire. This was called volley fire and the way it worked was that they would usually spread out into three ranks. The first rank would open fire and then reload, the second rank would do the same as well as the third and they would repeat. By keeping this up they could pour continuous fire into the enemy. Now despite a few times in the battle when the Zulus break through their lines before being repelled, the horns of the buffalo was largely ineffective at Rourke's Drift. It was best used out in the open but here the British have an outpost with defences and barriers and the Zulus would find themselves in contained kill zones where avenues of gunfire would inflict horrendous casualties. After a whole day and night of fighting the situation looks dire, completely exhausted British weight as the Zulus begin their final charge. And so begins what is probably the most famous scene in the entire film when the Zulus start singing and the British are just staring death in the face. <laughs> What happens here, which I absolutely love, is that Lieutenant John Char looks to one of his men and says, You think the Welsh can't do better than that, Owen? Well, they've got a very good base section, mine. But no top tenors, that's for sure. And so the British start singing Men of Harlech in response to the Zulu singing, and it almost turns into a sing-off it's hard to describe but it's absolutely beautiful how these two songs collide with one another like two alien worlds united in battle with the use of voice finally the zulus charge and as our characters make their last stand we witness the true destructive power of the volley fire system After the battle the British almost seem traumatised and I really appreciate how we don't see any cheers of victory. They just seem relieved to have even survived so you feel the weight on their shoulders for going through such a horrific thing. There's definitely an anti-war sentiment going on here and the film doesn't revel in ideas of glory. It's just stating what happened and the conflict both the Zulus and the British went through. We actually see the characters torment of what they just witnessed and question their own moral values. Does everyone feel like this afterwards? How do you feel? Sick. Well, you have to be alive to feel sick. If you asked me, I told you. There's something else. I feel ashamed. Was that how it was for you? First time. First time. I think I could stand this butcher's yard more than once. Even after all this destruction, the Zulus come back one last time and they appear on the hill overlooking the outpost. They then start singing again and because throughout the entire film we have seen the Zulus sing in charge, we expect them to do so again. The British, now on their last legs, expect to be wiped out and Bromhead simply says, what are you waiting for? Come on. Come on. But the movie takes an unexpected turn because the Zulus are actually applauding the British for their bravery and recognize them as worthy warriors. They're, they're saluting you. <laughs> they're saluting fellow braves. It's at this point that both sides develop a mutual respect for one another and this is something I haven't seen in many films. Though the Zulus and the British are complete polar opposites, they both recognise the courage it takes to go through battle and overcoming your fear. That it doesn't matter where you're from, it's these qualities that all soldiers can relate to.
Now, as much as I obviously love the film Zulu, there are a number of historical inaccuracies I need to address. For instance, when the Zulus are saluting the British, that never really happened. It's a great scene, but there's nothing written down to suggest that it really took place. The Zulus did appear one last time, but they were probably overlooking the British relief column pouring into Rourke's Drift before they finally left. Another thing is that they didn't retreat out of respect. They retreated because they weren't supposed to attack Rourke's Drift in the first place. In fact, King Ketchwayo gave specific orders not to attack the British. He had won an important battle at Isandalwana, and he could state his case that he was simply defending his homeland. In the movie, we see King Ketchwayo at the wedding ceremony giving the order to leave Zululand and attack the British, which completely contradicts what he really wanted, and that was forcing the British to renegotiate. By attacking Rourke's Drift, he could be seen as an aggressor, which was the last thing he wanted, and was, unfortunately, the exact excuse the British needed to reinvade Zululand. By the defeat at Isandalwana, the British lost because they underestimated the Zulus. The Zulus lost at Rourke's Drift because they underestimated the British. And finally, when the British start singing Men of Harlech back to the Zulus, that never really happened either. But I personally feel that this change brought an extra sense of passion and energy to that scene. That despite of all of these historical inaccuracies, they don't hamper the film too much and that in fact, I think they add more to the drama and conflict going on. Because none of the changes are insulting, the core of the film still stays true to actual history. And that is why I think this film succeeds where so many other historical films fail. Well that about wraps it up. My name is Nick Hodges and thanks for watching History Buffs. And remember, if you like the show, help the channel grow. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button and let me know what did you think about Zulu and of course, what historical film should I review next? Until then, I'll see you next time. <laughs>